Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with a former firefighter and paramedic turned attorney and is now a highly regarded U.S. law professor. You don't want to miss this. Just a reminder, the PDF transcript of this audio is available to download. Go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. As many of you know, we interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsel, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode 37 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of both men and women serving as leaders and executives in the legal industry. Enjoy a front row seat as Chris Batt speaks with general counsel, legal consultants, and law firm leaders and law partners at the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Bill Henderson, law professor and Stephen F. Burns Chair of the Legal Profession at Indiana University Marr School of Law. As a law professor, Bill instructs students on business law, project management, and the economics and structure of the legal profession. Bill is also a master plate spinner, having influenced or co-founded many ventures, such as the Institute for the Future of Law Practice, or also known as IFLIP which creates curriculum and organizes paid internships for T-shaped legal professionals. He is also the founder and primary editor of Legal Evolution, an online publication focused on solving very difficult legal industry problems. Bill received a double bachelor's degree in economics and history from Case Western and his law degree from University of Chicago. Welcome, Bill, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Wonderful, Chris. Thanks for having me. So, Bill, you know, I've actually removed much of the additional accolades that followed you, but you really are an influencer of the entire law profession. I've had many people tell me I need to speak to you or have you on the podcast. So thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Let's just jump in with a a general question. Why law, Bill? What got you into the legal profession? So uh, I went to law school later in life. I was 35 when I started law school. And uh, if you go back to my uh, my undergraduate days, I did my, uh, my first two years at Case Western Reserve. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. So I went to Case uh, with 20 minutes away and uh, for my first two years of college. Then I went did my junior year abroad. And the zeitgeist of the 1980s was the Reagan Revolution. I didn't want to be a Reagan revolutionary during <laughs> my time at the London School of Economics. And so I dropped out. And I became a uh, came back to Cleveland and, and uh, did a you know ran a, a small uh, business and eventually got a job as a firefighter paramedic and it was only being the uh, the union rep that I began negotiating contracts and doing grievances where I, I was working a- across the the table from attorneys and, and I found I was highly engaged in that and so I, uh, I I got pulled back and well you can't go to law school unless you finish college and so I finished my undergraduate degree and then uh, with some mentorship ended up going to to law school at University of Chicago. That's amazing. So you went from being a firefighter and a paramedic to be a law school professor. <laughs> yeah. <That's> a- <laughs> I, I've actually over the years gotten a few emails from other people that are that are active firefighters that are going to law school now. So, it, no it, but, so it's not unprecedented, but maybe going into the academy was a, was a little bit unusual. Do you miss the action of that? I have great relationships with my former colleagues. I'll probably see them next month and looking forward to breaking bread with uh, them uh, here. But it was time to move on. And uh, I've actually written a little bit about my experience and why I left the fire department. But it was the right decision at the right time. But I have no regrets. That's amazing. And help my listeners understand, did you jump right into teaching or did you practice law? Because it sounds like you were involved in some labor related matters. I went to law school uh, at University of Chicago, got some really terrific, and, and, and had a mentor at Case Western Reserve that was a law professor that, that made me think that that may be what I wanted to do. Uh, and so I, I, I started producing scholarship while I was in law school that would mm-hmm. build my academic file. But I had a mentor, a couple of mentors at University of Chicago that said, look, if you, if you can get a teaching position because you're a little bit older, you should go for it. And uh, after my time at the Court of Appeals at the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, uh, Chicago Kent gave me a visiting position. I got a grant to do some research. So I built my scholarship file even more. And then Indiana, uh, you know, offered me a job, you know, uh, after my visiting appointment, Chicago Kent. And, you know, that was a tier one law school. And so I uh, took it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sounds very wise. And it sounds like it's done you well. Can you share with my audience kind of the course curriculum that has made you and kind of put your stake in the ground for who you are as a law professor? Yeah. Well, uh, going back to my University of Chicago days, one of the most memorable experiences was my classmates that were doing on-campus interviews. I was trying to get a job in Cleveland to support my family, but they were frantically trying to decide between all these different law firms and and uh, the more, firms are more alike than they were different. And I thought the one critique I had of my classmates was is that they were really choosing among firms that, uh, that that came to campus and they weren't pulling back and seeing what how they could use their gifts to drive a satisfying career. It was, seemed like they were adopting the kind of the, the, the values perspective of the herd as opposed to thinking about themselves as individuals. So anyway, I created a course at Indiana called How Law Firms Are Businesses because I wanted my students to have time to reflect upon the career and from that teaching that course, I started pulling data sets from American Lawyer and, and started writing articles based upon stuff that I was discovering by teaching this class in Indiana. And nobody had ever, you know, kind of built a specialty on, on the business of law. And I just kind of fell into it by accident because my students were interested. I was enjoying teaching. I, I liked writing these articles. And, and then the world started to shift. Uh, in 2007, 2008, first yep. the market over Houston, and then it collapsed. And so I was the I was the right person at the right time. So it was it was it was a combination of luck and opportunity that that launched my career in terms of doing empirical research on the legal industry and legal education. Yeah, and so much change has happened. I mean, you've gotten to see the forefront of it from a academic perspective. Let me ask you this. I mean, give us a perspective of what has happened to the the business of educating lawyers. Since you started, I think it was back in 2003, so 16 years now, you've seen some of the most dramatic things happen to the legal industry. What's changed over the years? It's a great question, Chris. The biggest change from just like 2002, 2003 to say 2007 is the market overheating. And we and, and entry-level salaries went from uh, 95 to 125 while I was in law school, then 125 to 140, then 140 to 160. And uh, there was so much demand for corporate legal services that it was escalating. There was a short supply of elite law school graduates or people on law review. It was jacking up the salaries. And then the market collapsed in 2008 with the financial crisis. And uh, and so it went from super eager market where a quarter of the students in Indiana were getting jobs in large law firms to the market collapsing. And one of the things that happened was is that we went from a peak employment of, of classes that entered in 2010. So if you entered law school in 2010, you graduated in 2013, uh, and then the market was terrible. And since then, the uh, the law school uh, enrollment has fallen by almost 30%. So imagine wow. running a hotel or an airline when, uh, when you have 30% vacancy. And so we're really beginning to figure out, and so that the word innovation began to be used by law schools because – oh my God, the world has changed here and we need to, we want people to enroll in law school. Well, we better figure out what's going on in the market. So we're, we're in the early stages of sorting out, I, I would say, a hundred year flood paradigm shift. I mean, it's kind of settled how things have changed, except that things have changed. Yeah. Let's segue into the Institute for Law Practice. Please share with us what's going on with this organization. The Institute for the Future Law Practice takes a, a built curricula related to what we call T-shaped legal professionals. So law school provides deep substance knowledge at the, the bottom of the T, but the horizontal portion of the T at the top is uh, data analytics, process project management, uh, technology, design thinking, and, and business operations. And uh, these are, we, we feel like the world we're headed into, whether you're trying to reform the civil justice system so that we have these state courts that are glutted with self-represented litigants, we need to re redesign how disputes are resolved for in state court for ordinary people, or you're in the most complex corporations and you're awash in complexity because you're doing work in a hundred different countries and and you've got all these regulations to comply with in privacy and data, et cetera. We need to increase lawyer productivity for every unit of legal professional effort, for every hour of legal professional effort. We need to get more throughput done. And the only way that's going to happen is through combining law with allied disciplines like the top of the T. And we don't think of the founders of this. We, we just think that the Legal Academy is not well situated to adapt in a timely fashion to build out that curricula. So we're, we're building that curricula outside of the academy. We're arranging for students to get jobs that go through our program, and we'll eventually bolt this back on to the traditional uh, uh, law school curricula. But we want to prove out the concepts 
uh, that this curriculum gets students on the tremendous uh, upward mobile path in the legal industry, you know, build it upon these skills. And so uh, that, you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 2018 after a four-year pilot at Colorado Law School. And we started with one boot camp in Chicago in 2018, and now we got three boot camps, one in Colorado, Chicago, in Toronto, and we're out there raising money to, so we can build this curricula that will eventually be used to upskill the legal profession. What does that look like? I mean, what kind of attorneys are you producing from this kind of curricula that you're developing? We think that the world we're heading into is going to be much more law. The legal field is going to be much more multidisciplinary, and we're trying to set people up so they have enough foundational knowledge to collaborate effectively in these organizations to kind of understand what's possible. And the key point is, is if you've never had anything, if you've never been exposed to any kind of data or data visualization, data analytics, or you've never been exposed to the power of process, uh, you don't know much about business operations principles or design thinking, and you're a sec- or your fifth, sixth, eighth year lawyer, you become too expensive to train, you become a bottleneck in change efforts. And so the idea would be give people exposure to these disciplines enough to be fairly conversant at them so that they become uh, part of the coalition of the willing uh, when clients push for different ways of solving legal problems. Because uh, one of the huge issues we have is, is six, eight hundred dollar an hour lawyers that don't understand that there's a better way to do what they're doing and it can give clients more value. And they've never been educated on it. So we're trying to create a time efficient. I mean, part of this is to install it in, in young lawyers early in their career. But another possibility is to create a mid-career professional program, super time-efficient, fun, uh, low-per-unit cost, very relevant to what you do on Monday and Tuesday. You can use your job on Wednesday. Uh, we're, we're trying to build an IP uh, or e-learning platform that serves not only students but mid-career professionals. We're trying to well, – it's a design problem that we, so that we can upskill the profession as cheaply and as time-efficiently as possible. Yeah, that's exciting. When do you see – the more veteran attorneys tapping into that e-learning platform. You always go with the coalition of the, the willing, the people that are kind of young at heart, uh, the people that are curious. But uh, we want to. We're hoping to build out that the, these offerings in the course of the next uh, one to two years. We've got to raise the money to do it. Uh, I'll give you just Chris to give you an example. You can take a subject matter expert and you have them give a lecture. The only problem with that is you can't scale it, and that person who's giving the lecture should be doing other work. And so it's not uh, efficient over time to have them repeat themselves over and over again. So take that intellectual know-how and methodology, do it once, put it into something that can be scaled and delivered to thousands of people at a very high quality level, and then everybody wins here. But it's capital intensive. You have to you have to choreograph the lecture. You have to you have to put it on an e-learning platform that, that is fun and easy to use. And, and maybe add in some, some assessments and some annotated checklists and, and learning aids and, uh, and make it, you know, you know, one click away at a very low, you know, price point. And so that when an attorney says, my client's asking me about data analysts, I don't know much about it. And within two hours, they actually can learn quite a bit and they can do it at, the, at, at their own desk and uh, they can do it at their own pace. I mean, that's the vision that we're hoping to move forward. Yeah. And Bill, is this something you're going to license to the other law schools or people just have to come to you guys for it? We hope that this will migrate into the second and third year of law school. So it gets installed early. Uh, uh, whether whether we license it or not here, I don't know exactly how that business model is going to play out here. We want to build it and we want to recoup the cost of building it. So uh, there's a variety of different ways of, of, of how we go about doing that probably going to be a certification program. You can't all be done on the e-learning platform. You want to do some live. You can learn knowledge um, asynchronously because you can't learn skills and judgment asynchronously. You have to learn that in context. And so it's going to be a mix of of live and e-learning. And whether we license it or not here, we'll have to see. We'll have to see the best business model. It's not to make a profit. It's to to disseminate knowledge. That's the goal. Yeah, that's exciting. You use the example of the private practice attorney law partner billing six to eight hundred. Is this also applicable to corporate legal departments and their attorneys? Yeah, as a matter of fact, Chris, that's a really good point. And your in your role as a recruiter, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing this. There's now as many lawyers working in house in U.S. companies as there are uh, lawyers working at, at the AMLAW 200 domestically. Yep. And if you, if you if you look at some of the bigger legal departments, they're really law firms embedded inside corporations, yep. and they're 
starting to be broken down by different practice groups. Uh, you have many corporations that if you did a head count of lawyers, they'd be in the Amlaw 200 easily. We're trying to create a, a training that is both on the buy side and the sell side. I sometimes, a lot of taps into the field of legal, legal operations. Legal operations has been viewed by many as a role inside a legal department, but actually it's really a role inside any legal service organization. So you see the term legal operations showing up a lot in law firms these days. And so there's a lot of uh, innovation people who have taken on the title of chief ahead of legal operations and their client facing. So uh, that's the that's the space we're playing. Let's jump to your blog and legal evolution. Would you mind sharing with my audience any of the specific topics that are kind of being hotly either read, commented on, or debated, discussed as far as solving problems? I know the Institute for the Future Law Practice is something you're addressing, and it's a really critical issue, probably addressed on legal evolution. But any other topics that are coming up? Legal evolution was formed, uh, I, I, I started in 2017. And the basic, I thought there was a need to uh, cover uh, innovation on a deeper dive, like so you, more than a newspaper article, more like a law.com article, but less than an academic article and more written in a more accessible way, but still uh, analytically uh, rigorous and with you know citations to data and theory, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so the, the main thing that I've written about on legal evolution is is applying diffusion theory to different examples of uh, of, of legal technology, legal startups, and some innovations taking place in either legal departments or law firms. And, uh, and you know, the, if you hit the about page on legal evolution, it takes you through a series of foundational or cites a bunch of series of foundational posts on diffusion theory. Being, and that's a, that's a well-developed theory in the social sciences for how innovation gets adopted. And I just apply it to law. So lots of the articles that are on there. What gets a lot of traffic is anything's related to law firm competitive strategy. Uh, there's a fair amount of stuff related to legal education. Jay Um, who's a thought leader in the space, she writes a lot about legal tech, and, uh, and she gets a ton of traffic related to that. I've got a couple of legal technologists that have written, written for us, and they explain things like software or uh, platform and subscription, as opposed to software as a subscription. I had some great stuff on that. and. Uh, We've written about Microsoft a lot and the stuff they're doing with their trusted advisor program. Deep dives on legal technology. I've written some stuff on on uh, Hot Shot and uh, Lawyer Exchange and uh, oh, a few other different uh, startups. And so, uh, the thing I would say, if you boil it down here, it's, it's innovation in the in legal space. Uh, so, a variety of different. Things. Yeah. So, in addressing, like, say, competition of law firms. Let's just go straight to kind of what the elephant is in the room right now, which is the big four. What's your perspective, Bill, on these behemoths of professional service organizations beginning to encroach on the world of law competitively in the United States? So, Chris, that's a really good question. It may be perceived as a threat to law firms, but it's not a threat to lawyers because the big four hires lawyers. A lot of my students work for Deloitte, PwC. ENY, KPMG, et cetera. I got students from all of those things. So, so, so it's like, uh, is a lawyer job going to go away? No, no. You, you join these big uh, pro- global professional service organizations. And so is it a threat to lawyers? No, it's an employer for lawyers. So what it really is, is a threat to lawyers kind of like guarding their pie here and them owning everything. The big four are getting into the space. They're starting a more operational commodity type legal work. They're doing a lot in Europe. Uh, they, they, they're selling to general counsel, so legal work is being done, but being sold into kind of lawyer-to-lawyer businesses. And I, I think it's uh, it's really overblown. And if you're a mid-sized firm, uh, you have something to worry about if you want to stay an independent entity. But the thing is, is that at some point or another, uh, your, 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 your lawyers can vote with their feet, and they may go to your competitor that's made bigger investments that the competitor compete toe-to-toe with the big four. Because remember, uh, these law firms have have, have practice expertise uh, or specializations that they're known for. The big four does not have the leading M&A practice. They don't have a leading regulatory practice. They can't do that. So they're doing more operational commodity type of work here. So the, the firms have got some strong hand to play, but they need to invest in uh, the kind of stuff that the big four is invested in the business of law kind of stuff, the, the operations, the process. And so uh, I, 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 this is going to play out. I think it's overblown. 
uh, I think the firms are going to have to invest if they want to go toe to toe or they want to evolve over the test timer. But it's, uh, lawyers will make you live. You'll either get your paycheck from from PwC or you get it from Baker McKenzie or mm-hmm. or Latham or something like that. Here, but folks, if you're if you're a law firm managing partner, hey, wake up! It's time to actually you're in a game of strategy. Are you going to make investments, strategic investments, or, or, or your old model is not going to last? You I'm just selling time. That that's going away. Bill, define for us mid-sized firms and the firms that you would perceive as vulnerable. Firms that that are that are kind of regional super regional firms that, that aren't making investments in process and find that they, they really have a difficult time attracting the best in class people to deal with this idea of being able to do more with less. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there are uh, law firms out there that are making a play for what is called the middle market. There's a whole tranche of, of law firms that think, oh, we're middle market. Well, there's, there's big, sophisticated law firms uh, that are that are eyeing how to to take middle market, how to aggregate all those middle market leads, some of which become bigger companies later, and they're they're starting to make big investments in talent, big investments in technology, big, big investments in process, and they have a global footprint. And even most businesses today have some international touch and some international commerce, and so the idea that the super regional can can service them, you know. It's a little unrealistic. The, the super regionals are going to have to make investments, and so I don't want to name names, but probably any firm that's in the M law, uh, you know, it's in the National Law Journal, like the the uh, anywhere between fifty to uh, to three fifty. I mean, those are all somewhat vulnerable. You can push off that threat by becoming highly specialized. I mean, that's a class in what you do, but but to be a fairly general service and, and to not make these investments. You know, that's going to make you vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, definitely fair. Let's talk about the fun notion that has taken on a reality in other parts of the world of law firms taking on non-attorney ownership. What is your prediction, Bill, to the ABA eventually caving and allowing this to occur in the United States? The ABA serves only in an advisory role. They promulgate the model rules. The model rules are influential with the state bars and state Supreme Courts to get adopted. Uh, because a lot of thought goes into drafting them. Uh, right now, we have states like uh, Arizona, California, and Utah. It's interesting that they're all out west that are they're thinking about modifying Rule 5.4, and uh, so that to permit non-lawyer investment in businesses that practice law. I think that it's going to be jurisdictions that begin to to say, hey, for access to justice reasons we can't abide by uh, the status quo because there's there's too much self-represented litigation going on in state courts that it seems like consumers aren't getting a fair shake and so i think some states are going to go first and change the rules so nobody's bound by the ada and there's groups of lawyers like the uh, association of uh, professional responsibility lawyers something called april that they're they're advising they're pretty influential and they're they're trying to move the uh, the states and the and the ABA along to to modifying Rule 5.4. Uh, I think it's going to change, but if you look at what's happened in the UK and Australia, that that doesn't dramatically change the legal sector. It just it provides the capital that's necessary to begin to speed up the innovation process. And yeah. So it's, when you change the rule, it doesn't change things dramatically. Yeah. So would you say it's a matter of when versus if? Yes. Okay. Richard Susskind went on record in, in in his recent books, Tomorrow's Lawyers Say. Over the next 20 years, you know, the entire global profession will be liberalized. Yeah. He's probably right. He's been right about so much, so much up to now here. That seems to be the case. And uh, California started moving pretty rapidly recently, and I was a disbeliever until, you know, uh, and then I got called up to draft the, the California's landscape report, and then that was the precursor research that went into a new task force that, that went to, to think about changing the rule of California. So uh, it turned me into more of a believer. I was I was more skeptical that the rules would ever change, but now I see a lot of movement. So do you think it's going to take 20 years for the U.S. 50 states to adopt this, or do you think it's going to be less than 20 years? Chris, that's a really good question. I think that some jurisdictions are going to go first. California goes first, and then New York has to think about it. And uh, there's some people that are agitating the, the, the federal government to get involved here because because legal services is something where the American economy dominates, and you don't want them to be disadvantaged vis-a-vis the UK or Australia or somewhere else. So, 
So I, 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 I just don't know enough to predict how it's going to play out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if California goes, that's, uh, that's kind of a game changer because, uh, yep. you know, that's, that's an economy bigger than the UK. Yeah. Let's pivot to a notion that was brought up in my episode 13 with James Fisher of Fisher Broyles. You're probably familiar with their model that's more of a virtual law firm model. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he had mentioned in that episode, my interview with James Fisher, that they were looking at the training and education of a lawyer from an apprentice approach, kind of similar to what doctors go through. What's your thoughts on that? Hey, well, we, we favor that. I mean, the Institute of the, for the Future Law Practice is one of the one of the programs that we put in place that we hope more law schools will, will adopt is your fifth semester of law school, so the beginning of your third year, from from the end of your second year in May uh, to uh, December of your third year, you're on a paid field placement where you get academic credit. And we've got students now at Perkins Coie, Chapman and Cutler, Common, Cisco that are making a apprentice wage. Actually, it's a pretty good apprentice wage, and uh, and they're getting academic credit. And you know, we we call that a residency, kind of baked into the four corners of your law degree. Nice. The apprentice wage is a lot less than the uh, extravagant summer associate salaries, and so it's cheap enough to, to to it's a wage that you can train people on. Here's a fun question, and kind of pulling from Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, and I think Jeff Bezos. You know. We always talk about what is changing over the next 10 years. What's not going to change for the next 10 years to know of in the legal industry? The importance of relationships will not change. They'll become more important, although it's harder to maintain relationships in this kind of like a soundbite uh, world. But, mm-hmm. but, but relationships will continue to be absolutely crucial and key. I think uh, we, we will rediscover uh, thoughtful communication and, and, and realize that we should be investing in thoughtful communication and uh, how to communicate more effectively. I think that we're going to rediscover the value of culture uh, in the workplace uh, because culture speeds things up and culture enriches our lives. And so uh, I think these are kind of, these are not new ideas. These are old ideas, but we're going to rediscover them and we're going to go or we're going to double down and we're going to reinvest in these ideas. That would be my take. Communication, culture, and uh, things like uh, in relationships, yeah. Bill, what books should be written that are not written yet for the legal, kind of the legal industry, the legal executive industry? Well, I'm writing a case study on the Cisco legal department that I want to turn into a short book, and I've made some pretty good progress on that. And I just think I learned that especially busy executives like to learn through example and through a narrative. So you got to you got to bake in the learning into a kind of a story format, and so. That's one that I'm trying to uh, fill. <laughs> That's what I'm personally doing. Uh, the other ones with the gaps to fill, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 there's a lot of great books out there. I have no shortage of books that I should be reading. So <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> the, the, one, the one gap I've identified I'm trying to fill. Okay, very good. Let's dive into a little bit more of your own personal life. So I understand you're married and you have a daughter. Is that correct? Yes, uh, married to 26 uh, years to my wife, uh, Mary, awesome. and we've got a, a 22-year-old daughter that'll be graduating from the University of British Columbia University in Vancouver this year, and uh, she uh, she's an anthropology major. She does work for me at Legal Evolution. She, she codes and transcribes for me, so I've got an excellent legal researcher, my anthro- anthropology daughter. <laughs> That's excellent. Congratulations. What do you guys do in your spare time now that you're a, uh, I mean, I don't imagine you stop working in the summer, but how do you and your wife and daughter maybe enjoy your summer? Huh. Well, my daughter's in Vancouver where the weather's perfect. And yeah. so, uh, <laughs> she seems to be spending time outdoors and hiking and doing things like uh, like that. My wife and I enjoy biking. We live in Chicago in the summer. And uh, so we enjoy doing that. We cook out in our backyard, spend time with our pets. And um, uh, my wife would say, uh, we don't spend enough time uh, goofing around, you know, but we like to explore the city of Chicago. And um, we hope to do a little bit more traveling. So, Well, if you're in Chicago, I have to ask, are you uh, either a Cubs or a White Sox fan? I'm a Cleveland fan because I'm from <laughs> Cleveland. And so, uh, so if I have to pick, I, probably a little bit more White Sox than the Cubs Okay, uh, here, but I'm a big baseball, a big baseball fan here. So uh, Indians are my team. I'm very partisan. understand. If there's places you and your wife would travel to, where what's on your list? 
my wife wants to go to Greece. We went to, to Italy for our 25th wedding anniversary, and uh, it was mm, a spectacular nice. trip here. And so Greece is on her bucket uh, list. We want to get to Ireland. That's on her list uh, so far. And anything that's got a beach. Oh, Hawaii. She has not been to Hawaii, and so we have to do that. That's excellent. Tell me about your bookshelf. Now, being a professor, my assumption is that you're a big reader. What books do you recommend for my listeners, since I ask all my guests on the show to suggest books? And share with my listeners what you do each year. You share that with me. A lot of things are related to psychology and decision uh, making. So, uh, oh, Dan Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, Chris Arduous is uh, uh, Teaching Smart People How to Think. Carol Dweck's mindset. We a lot of business books. Peter Thiel's Zero to One was a classic. I have a book called Deep Works by Cal Newport. It's really basically the theory behind the knowledge worker of the future. A book that I sent to my friends last year that had a big influence on me was was Robert Wright's Why Buddhism is True. And uh, I got onto that book because uh, I read Dave Ray Dalio's book, Principles. And one of the principles that Ray Dalio talked about was 40 years of meditation. And Robert Wright, who's a, a secular humanist, wanted to understand the science behind Buddhist meditation. Anyway, uh, the short uh, the short version of it was is that he, he went on this journey and he got tremendous benefit out of uh, meditation. And so I read the book and and uh, and was astonished by uh, by how much I learned from it. I gave it away to everybody who would read it. So uh, I I heartily recommend that book. Uh, and we're all human beings, and it's, that's really what this is about. Yeah, it is about, and I, I love that. And I appreciated your list of books. And I think we came to a common denominator that we both have a fondness for Charlie Munger. Yes, <laughs> love Charlie. What was the the video you described that everyone must listen to or watch? Uh, there's an MP3, uh, but it's also on YouTube, of Charlie Munger called 24 Causes of Human Misjudgment, a speech that he gave at, at Harvard uh, in 1995 that basically was uh, was just a uh, psychology that he had developed over time uh, to a variety of different sources. Bob Cialdini was, uh, was a big influence on it, but 24 ways in which we can make decisions errors and how to correct them. And, uh, and there, and there were things that are very practical that any professional that has to deploy judgment in their job would want to be aware of and it's how to avoid mistakes, basically. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, 24 causes of human misjudgment. You can Google it and find it. I've listened to that 30 times. So I do not like to make errors. I make a lot of them, but I want to make fewer of them. So. Yeah, it's a good thing we're human. Well, another question I want to ask, Bill, is in this is sort of in closing, but it's not my final question. With your perspective on the legal industry, what advice would you give students, whether they're considering law school or going into law school and looking at the profession going forward? Well, it's a good thing we just talked about Munger because the most important thing is is that you have to learn to think for yourself and you have to learn to trust your own reasoning ability. And so much of what we do, uh, we, we do because other people are doing it. And uh, if you got into law school, you're pretty smart. You need to use that reasoning ability to think independently. And, and you have to be comfortable uh, reaching your own conclusions and testing them uh, against you know other points of reality. And so uh, – uh, um, it's a hard thing to do, and, and students don't really realize that they're not thinking for themselves, that they're following the herd. But the most important thing is you have to learn to have independent judgment because people are dependent upon you to think independently. And, and so that's the number one thing here. you got to trust. you got to learn to think for yourself. Bill, last question. What is the one book you would have with you on an island? Oh, boy, that's a really, really, really good question. Oh, um, oh, <laughs> I, I'd have to say that it would have to be some sort of a storytelling book uh, here. It would, it would have to be some sort of anthology uh, because I, I, I've learned to appreciate uh, uh, stories. Oh, boy. Uh, now you really asked me a, a tough question. I'd say, Chris, can I have more time here? Because I, <laughs> I'm going to go without it forever here. But it would be actually a uh, 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 Bertrand Russell's book uh, that's kind of a philosophical history of all the great uh, philosophers of all time, all told in a narrative, uh, you know, format. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm a, I am read a lot of existential philosophy early in my life. I read a lot of Soren Kierkegaard and, uh, and, and things that are less economic and less uh, legal and more in the, in, in the vein of uh, what's, what's your purpose in life. 
That's excellent. Bill, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for your time on the show today. Hey, Chris, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or would like to recommend someone to be on the podcast, please email them to podcast at findthelions.com. If you like this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. Also, share our podcast via email or social media. To share a podcast, listen to more shows, or read the transcription of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.